This is our last video of the plant uh, topic. And in this video, we're gonna look at transport in angiosperms. Uh, and this is gonna be our second part where we look specifically at minerals and primarily the transport of uh, sugars, sucrose via the phloem. And this is IV section 9.2. Now, going back to our previous video, we talked about how minerals and ions are absorbed um, through the root structure of different plants. Uh, and these structures are arranged to increase surface area in terms of, uh, or in relation to their, to their volume, which inherently increases the overall absorption. And <clears throat> the root structure is able to do this by um, producing these uh, structures called root hairs, which protrude down into the soil and absorb the minerals and the ions, and then it gets transferred uh, to the different cells to be transported to the different parts of the cell. Well, we're gonna focus on, on this portion and how the, the substances, uh, specifically the sucrose, gets moved throughout the cell um, uh, and how that process works. But before we get there, we're gonna look at some adaptations of a plant group called the xerophytes. And these are plant species with adaptations that help them to survive in a very arid environment or desert-like environment. For example, like Joshua Tree in California, um, very hot and, and arid environment that uh, requires some very specific adaptations to help these species survive. And you're only required to know four different types of adaptations. There's lots of different adaptations um, for these different types of, of plant species, but we're gonna just look at four of them specifically in this case. And the first is an adaptation of a hairy stomata. And remember, that the stomata is the opening uh, in the leaf structure that allows um, um, gas molecules to move in and out of the cells, uh, but as a consequence of that opening, water is able to diffuse out of that. And so plants in these types of environments want to uh, hold that water as much and as long as possible. Um, and so in this case, uh, with the hairy stomata, the stomata are actually located in kind of pits that are surrounded by hairs. And these, uh, these pits trap moist air and thus reducing diffusion and reflecting sunlight. Secondly, we have water storage. And in this case, water storage tissues are present in the leaf, uh, leaf structure. And these, um, these species that have this adaptation have thick stems for water storage and vertical stems to avoid midday sun. Um, it helps them to have less surface area that's exposed to the midday sun. Um, the, third, the third adaptation is reduced and rolled leaves. Um, the rolling or the folding of, of leaf cells uh, due to low water causes them to be flaccid and reduces the area in which transpiration can occur. So species have some small leaves, some thick leaves, spines, or sometimes no leaves, um, and these adaptations help uh, to reduce overall water loss um, because they're either smaller or they're a little bit thicker. Uh, they have spines or sometimes no leaves at all. Um, in the case of a, a cactus, um, this would be a good example of this situation. The last one that we're going to look at is really, really interesting. And this is a, a group of plants called cam plants. And in cam plants, um, these plants basically have a modification of the overall process of photosynthesis. Um, and water uptake to prevent evaporation. And so what these plant species do, uh, rather than um, just completing both the light dependent and independent portions of photosynthesis at the same time, um, these plants have developed adaptations that basically split when these two different mechanisms occur, the light dependent and light independent. And so during the day, uh, the stomata are actually closed in order to um, reduce the amount of water that's lost. You can see in this image right here, stomata is closed during the day. Uh, the plant is still using light energy, so the light dependent reactions are able to occur. In the evening or at night, the stomata are open, which allows gases to diffuse in and out, um, but because it's not as hot at night, less water is going to evaporate. So the light independent reactions are able to occur at night. And so the, in this situation, these, this, these types of plants have divided when these two different um, steps to photosynthesis occur. Um, another adaptation um, uh, similar to cam plants is something called C4 plants. And in this situation, um, the plants actually create a four carbon molecule instead of a three carbon molecule uh, of the Calvin cycle. And essentially what these plants do is they separate the steps of the light dependent reactions 
um, and the light independent reactions. And so in this case, the light, uh, excuse me, the light dependent reactions are in the mesophyll cells, um, which lack rubisco. Uh, we talked about rubisco during our photosynthesis unit, and as a result, they cannot carry out photorespiration. Uh, um, CO2 is added to a three carbon molecule and transferred to bundle sheath cells, uh, which have a very low amounts of oxygen to, pre to prevent photorespiration. And so then that four carbon molecule gets broken down into CO2 and pyruvate. It's kind of going above and beyond what you need to know. But basically these C4 plants, what they have developed is um, the two different steps, the photo, uh, the light dependent um, reactions occur in mesophyll cells specifically and the light independent cells um, occur uh, or light independent reactions occur in the bundle sheath uh, sheath cells and so there's some different locations for for these different steps of photosynthesis some examples of plants that that do this would be like crabgrass and corn and sugarcane um, and it often occurs in areas with really high daytime temperatures and intense sunlight so some pretty cool adaptations to help these plants to survive so now we want to get into the specifics of the phloem and, and what this structure does in plants um, it's primary job is to carry organic nutrients to different parts of the cell, um, uh, different parts of the plant. Uh, these molecules need to be transported in order that, so that the plant, different portions of the plant get, can get minerals, ions, sugars, um, and, and it's often primarily transporting sucrose. So here's a nice cross-section image um, where we can see uh, the xylem and here's the phloem separated by the cambium. We can see the cortex and epidermis in this image. Uh, if we look at a second image here that's broken down a little bit further, here's our cross section. And so this is a vertical, uh, basically transport tube in which water in the xylem and as we're gonna see sucrose in the phloem can be transported throughout the stem and, and, and throughout different parts of the plant. Here we've got our xylem, uh, the cambium which separates the two and then the phloem. And so let's take a look at how this process works. I'm going to kind of describe through it and then I'll also put up some steps that you can see these um, and you kind of get it both visually and then written down in words for whichever way is going to help you best. Um, the first kind of process of this is transpiration. And we've talked about this in our previous video in which water gets pulled up the xylem vessels, basically moving from areas of higher concentration uh, in the roots to the lower concentration in leaves where the water is evaporating. Um, the sucrose cells where photosynthesis is occurring, um, these sucrose cells can or, or take the sucrose that's produced and load it into the uh, phloem tubes, um, reducing their water potential. And so uh, because that sucrose is moved into the phloem, uh, there's a lower concentration of water in, 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 that, in that area. And so water is going to diffuse into the phloem. Um, and the glucose or the sucrose that's produced is, is made, um, made from photosynthesis. Um, it's converted to sucrose for transport. It's an easier form of transport. Um, and a companion cell actively loads the sucrose uh, into the phloem. Uh, as I said, water uh, flows from the xylem um, to the phloem by osmosis, moving it from high to low concentration. And what this does is it produces kind of a sugary sap uh, that could allows it to be easily transported throughout the cell. Um, the sap volume and pressure increases to give mass flow. So water is taken up here by the xylem, um, by osmosis, as I said, raising the, the pressure potential in, in these tubes. Um, the internal pressure differences drive the sap down the tube to something called a sink cell. Um, and that's where the, the sucrose gets unloaded or, or delivered to, is these sink cells. Um, and this is also helped by, uh, by a companion cell. Uh, the sucrose gets stored in these sink cells, um, which can sometimes be um, uh, roots or fruits or developing seeds. Um, and then that water that was in this sap uh, is the sucrose is removed and the water is released back into the xylem to be reused and removed. Um, and so basically the water is getting recycled and so it kind of forms a cycled chain. Um, so the, the leaves are producing the, the glucose which gets turned into sucrose um, and, is get, and gets moved down to these sink cells for storage. 
So let's take a look, uh, closer look at what this looks like um, and, and look more specifically at this idea of mass flow. Here is our, our basically tubes or sieve tubes where these molecules that are being transported through translocation are being moved. And these are the companion cells. And the companion cells are cells with nucleus and organelles, whereas the, the tubes for transport are basically hollow cells without organelles. Um, to allow the, the molecules to move through them. And so this idea of mass flow is basically that um, the, the molecules in the sap is going to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if this is the um, source cell where, where the, the sucrose is being produced, it's going to mix with water, and this would be an area of very high concentration. In the sink cell, an area of low concentration. And so the idea is that the molecules get transported um, through the, 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 xyl um, the phloem, excuse me, to these sink cells um, by movement from high concentration to low concentration. And so to kind of sum all of this up, translocation is the movement of organic molecules, sugars, amino acids, um, from a source cell uh, through the phloem to the sink or storage cells. And this whole process requires energy. Um, that energy is provided by uh, metabolism by, by breaking down uh, the sugars and converting them to ATP. So this process does require energy. It's not energy uh, free um, and, and fortunately for plants they're able to produce their own energy. Um, so I'll give you a list here of the kind of different steps written out in words. Um, the first step, companion cells load sucrose into the phloem. Water flows the high solute into the phloem by osmosis. Uh, this is passive transport because sucrose causes a concentration gradient. The positive uh, pressure potential develops, moves mass of phloem sap upward, called mass flow. The phloem sap, which is the water and the sugar, crosses the C plate, which basically separates the different uh, tube cells. The phloem sap is moved to a sink or a deposit cell made possible by lack of organelles in the phloem. Companion cells unload the, unload the organic molecules into the sink cell, which uses ATP. Organic molecules are stored as starch at sink, uh, the sink cells, uh, roots, growing fruits and seeds. Um, and, and so here would be some different examples of these fruits and potential seeds. That whole process is translocation, the movement of sugars or organic molecules uh, throughout the plant cells via the phloem.